Please, who's first? <laughs> Hi, I'm Teresa Gillespie from Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, United States. This question is for Dr. Kenyon. Kenyanju? Just say some. Okay. <laughs> uh, first, thank you very much for coming. Really appreciate that. Um, second, you made the comment in your presentation that um, many of the clinical trials, or most of them, are driven by um, local needs and uh, input. And what you described sounds very much like the model of community-based participatory research, which certainly in the United States is not the model for therapeutic clinical trials. And so I just wondered if that is very much the model from your experience, and if you could comment on how others might um, learn from that model. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I indicated, I think the traditional model, and which I think is still happening, unfortunately, in many places, is that it's driven from elsewhere. And my comment was that for us, because we have integrated uh, clinical trials as part of a larger research system, we are able to address a uh, local um, questions which you would really struggle to think about if you are not on the ground. So I'm not pretending that we have this amazing community engaged, uh, participatory driven, driven. What I meant is that we're able to see, for example, the examples given is, um, you know, until you have very good clinical surveillance system that can pick up the children that are dying in the first three hours of coming to hospital, mm -hmm. You'll be thinking about how do you treat malaria. You'll be working towards developing a malaria drug, but actually by realizing that uh, because you're locally pleased that the kids will die in three hours, you realize that it's not a parasitological treatment that is really lacking. It's something else completely. You need to correct uh, metabolic derangement that the children have by the time they come to hospital. So you'll start looking at a completely different type of a clinical trial that would be almost impossible to do mm -hmm. if you are doing in the best advanced molecular biology or chemistry lab somewhere else. That's not to say the others are not needed, it's just to say that there are questions which are really hard to answer unless you develop the local research capacity. And to ask those questions, you need that capacity. Uh, this question is for uh, Naptali. Um, I want to ask, um, if, you, if we now think the uh, phase three of the clinical trial, let's say cardiovascular disease or diabetes, usually we compare the outcome with existing therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder for the neglected disease, we haven't optimized existing therapies for known drugs. <coughs> so how can you say that they are superior than existing one? Thank you for the question. Yeah, it's a very good question. And indeed, sometimes you have to compare with um, not the optimal drug. That being said, in the Helsinki uh, Declaration, it is made very clear that you have to use in comparison the standard of care. And in fact, we've had some discussions sometimes, not for phase three, but for phase two, whether or not we could use placebo when we considered that looking at superiority over placebo in a, a non-debilitating and severe disease <coughs> could could provide a better uh, answer than using a drug which is standard of care but not very good and possibly toxic. And sometimes we have these type of questions for even for phase two. But I would say for phase three, we, we work with what we have and we do conduct non-inferiority trials with existing treatments. And these treatments, if you remember uh, what I said, it is striking that uh, sometimes you have no treatments. And sometimes you have not even, you don't even know what is the efficacy of the treatments, like in chronic Chagas disease. We now know, but we didn't know, uh, uh, if, well, if I would say a few years back, it wasn't solid evidence. So that, that makes it difficult. But when you have these drugs, like the drugs we have for sleeping sickness, so visceral leishmaniasis, efficacy is really high of the treatments. It's about 93, 94%. And this is what makes the, the uh, non-inferiority and the calculation of the sample size or of the margin of non-inferiority not very easy uh, to determine and requires a num high number of patients. But um, it's feasible. This is what you need to do. And then in your trial, you will look at safety and uh, you will also consider in the outcome value of the product not only the efficacy, but everything else that, you, that Sam also mentioned in terms of access to patients, how much will it increase 
the possibility of patients to be treated with something that works and that is safe. So a number of things are captured into your design that you still have to work according to the rules. But um, this is why I was saying that it is extremely important, I think, to work hand in hand or as close as possible with the regulators so they understand your challenges and so that you don't end up with a superb clinical development plan that will never end. So, you know, it's a case by case um, uh, story, but uh, your question is, is a very uh, tricky one we have to work with every day. Still three, three questions to go. <laughs> <laughs> Luis. <Before> the drink. <laughs> um, so this is a question for, for you, Ole. Oh dear. Is there any plans in place to coordinate activities between the EDCTP two activities uh, initiative and, and the gate-sponsored trial of the PDPs? Because, uh, I mean, I can envisage easily that there could be something or, or that could benefit from this uh, kind of close collaboration? Yeah, I, I think that's a good question in the sense that uh, we talk about partnerships, but we should not just talk, talk about partnerships between researchers, but also between funders. And we, um, we have a lot of uh, informal contacts with the larger funders, both the Gates Foundation, for example, and also the Wellcome Trust and a number of other funders. Um, so I think we are actually quite well informed with what each other are doing. The problem in many cases, I think, is the each organization have their own rules, their own procedures, which sometimes make it difficult and challenging to actually meet. But that is some of the things that I think indeed we should work on and become better as a community of funders to actually try to find ways how we can fund trials via different mechanisms, but in such a way that we don't duplicate, but try to, to synergize. So I think we are quite aware of it, and I think there's an increasing interest, I feel that, from other funders as well. I think leverage is the key word. Everybody's looking for collaboration and leverage so that we synergize with each other. Oh, um, hello, I'm Marianne from the ISNTD, and I just wanted to make a comment which is um, uh, not entirely uh, directly connected to clinical trials, but is um, in a roundabout manner of, of relevance. Um, I just wanted to pick up on a comment that um, was made by one of the delegates here, and I would like at the same time to salute Sam, who has come as a the delegate, the delegate um, <laughs> who's traveled 25 hours and, um, you know, thank you and welcome. And just to comment a little bit that um, as a science and an NTD community, we should um, definitely be aware of the barriers which exist um, to participating maybe acutely in the scientific meetings and perhaps just be quite aware in general of, um, of the barriers that exist. And at the same time, as we've been seeing throughout the day, seeing all these fantastic um, open source and collaborative initiatives and also in Trudy Lang's um, presentation, which, which really showed that perhaps even without being able to resolve all these barriers, um, they might just become obsolete anyway, given the new communication and the, the new co cooperation and collaboration tools that we have. And the barriers I'm referring to are things like travel and distance or um, budget, sometimes even language. I mean, most <coughs> of the meetings are um, in English and not um, everybody wants to or chooses to have English as their first language. So um, I just wanted to finish on a positive note uh, on, on that and just perhaps um, get your thoughts um, regarding this. Uh, we do have a lot of collaboration with health research centers um, in Guinea-Bissau, in Mozambique, in Angola, you know, we promote their work and so forth. And uh, we were quite happy to share a lot of information um, remotely and occasionally uh, meet. We met uh, in Lisbon, we had an event in Portuguese actually looking at um, health research um, in Lusophone African countries. So, um, you know, just wanting to comment on that and, and also be a little bit upbeat um, on, on, on this. No, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, having 
uh, said that I was the only one from uh, in this case. I, it doesn't mean that there isn't war going on in Africa. Uh, I think there's quite uh, some really good uh, research centers in Africa that you can name, um, whether it's Mozambique, whether it's in Tanzania, Ifakara, whether it's in Ghana, the Dodo and Avrongo and Kintapo, or whether it's in uh, uh, Mali, or of course South Africa and the Northern African countries will also have. So I think part of this is also about just maybe people not being aware that uh, these things are happening. At, at individual levels, you may be aware, so it may be that London School collaborates with uh, Tanzania and Oxford collaborates with Kilifi because a lot of the people in Oxford were from Kilifi or um, NIH collaborates with MRTC in Mali or something like that. And the Lusophone countries, of course, will collaborate with Barcelona and places like that, University of Barcelona. But I think the, the important thing is um, there's a whole group of people who are not aware of it. So uh, we have people from Pharma who may not have been aware of, of all these places that are happening. I, I know GSK is very aware because they've been running things like RTSS. And I think it's a, a, all about networking and, and spreading this sort of, uh, um, if you like, uh, networking information and the, the information that you come from here so that people become more and more aware of each other. People become aware that uh, there are sites uh, there are centers in, uh, in in the developing countries that are actual fully fledged research centers with capacity and with ability, and what they need to do is go and collaborate with them on equal terms rather than uh, the idea that you know you're going down to take a clinical trial to a site. So, although I did talk about the big gap that there still is in terms of capacity. Nonetheless, I would also like to talk about the gap that there is in awareness that actually there is capacity to a certain extent. Yeah. Also on another gap, I don't know what's your experience, but moving researchers from one country to another is becoming increasingly difficult. And talking from experience here, the Open Lab Foundation, it's so complicated. It takes us an average of six to eight months, sometimes even more, if we want to move a researcher from sub-Saharan Africa to a European country. It's not hard to imagine that probably in the US is a similar situation. And I was wondering if uh, as a community and having somebody here, well, not representing the PC anymore, I understand, it's not an uh, organization, but I think we should do something about this because, uh, yes, there's a lot of exchange of information, there's a fluid relationships between many organizations, but at the end of the day, you know, moving researchers is a big part of that. And it's definitely becoming a great limiting step uh, for science. You, you could, of course, also move the research, not necessarily the researchers. Uh, that's, that's okay, but in many instances, that's the best way of doing research, of having people with, you know, from two different labs uh, sharing space and sharing ideas mm. in a continuous manner. So at least that's the spirit of the open lab. And when, when it does happen, eventually we see progress being made. So. Yes, just just a comment from me, Martina Glieber von der Sumerieu, and I also wanted to thank very much the colleague from Camry for coming here. And uh, of course, we would have been happy to see more uh, African <laughs> uh, participants, but we understand that that's not so easy. But I would like to just say that, um, as I mentioned this morning, we are supporting the African. Um, capacity building within the European Foundation Initiative for res African research into entities. And we, we trained, trained now more than 30 postdoctoral uh, African uh, researchers, um, also from, from Camry and elsewhere. And now these, um, these students, let's say these researchers, have expressed the need and the wish <coughs> to become better networked and organized themselves within Africa and suggested the creation of an African research network for entities. And so we are starting discussions about that with other colleagues because as Ole said, we have to get better organized uh, with funding institutions and to create collaborations and partnerships to make it easier also for the African researchers to, to access funding and so on. So, I think it's important to help this community of African researchers on entity to, to, to better work, to better um, co collaborate within Africa, but also with European institutes. And also maybe to make some advocacy for 
the need to have research uh, on neglected tropical diseases and to strengthen capacities in Africa f for that. So um, uh, the organizers said there is a need for, uh, for creating collaborations and partnerships and if some of you are interested in, in knowing more about what the African researchers expressed as needs for us, to us for this African network, we would be happy to work together with, with you on, on that. Thank you very much. I, I have one question actually for Paul. On, uh, when you're doing your leprosy work, are you in any way networking or collaborating with other people in the mycobacterial community, so in the TB field and the Buruli also feel, considering that there are many similarities? Yeah, certainly. Well, we are supporting a lot of work in Buruli also, so there's a, a lot of synergy, not only in uh, the treatment, but also in the, the whole issue of morbidity management. And in fact, that is one area in which we are trying to integrate with a broader group of, of the NTDs, in particular lymphatic fluoriasis. Uh, so, so both morbidity management and then also early diagnosis of cases that have some skin manifestations, so lymphatic fluoriasis and leishmaniasis, uh, together with leprosy and Beruli ulcer. So, so that is still early, but, but they're very definite uh, attempts to, to integrate across those diseases. Mm -hmm. And with T TB, there's a much older partnership um, so in the, the 1990s, there were a lot of combined leprosy and TB programs, uh, and in some ways that has become less uh, at the moment, yeah. but uh, there's more integration with the management of complications now. Any last questions? <laughs> Otherwise, I think we are well done. Should we... Uh, Considering that we have uh, still managed to survive until now, give a hand for the panelists and yourself as well. Yes.